Hi, my name is Manish Gupta, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the Google Glam family of models, which are models which have been uh, efficiently trained uh, using mixture of experts architecture. So let's get started. What is Glam? Glam are sparsely activated mixture of expert models. They've been trained in a mixture of experts manner, and they are decoder only models. So in architecture, they are very similar to GPT-3 kind of models. They're decoder only, transformer based decoder only models using mixture of experts architecture and as such that they scale in terms of model capacity, but then the overall training cost is less compared to the dense model variants. Okay. So mixture of expert models by themselves are sparsely activated. And I'll talk in detail about what sparse activation in mixture of experts means, uh, but uh, they have a much larger number of weights, but still, uh, but still they have less training cost than the dense, densely activated models. Okay. Um, they train several variants of the several sizes of the GLAM model. Um, and a different number of experts in the mixture of experts, but the largest GLAM model contains 1.2 trillion parameters. So this is a truly trillion parameter range kind of a model. It is seven, seven times larger than GPT-3, and it has 64 experts per mixture of experts layer. Uh, and then each token, however, activates only 8% of the model. That is what I mean by sparsely activated model. So 96.6 billion parameters only. Uh, it consumes, the great parts are as follows. It consumes one third of the energy used to train GPT-3. So training is therefore much, much more energy efficient. However, in fact, on the other hand, it requires half of the computational flops for inference. So both training as well as inference efficiency are super awesome. You know, one third of the energy for training and half of the computational flops for inference. And the best part is that it is better. It, it's a better model. So achieves better overall zero shot, one shot, and few shot performance across 21 NLU and eight NLG different tasks. Overall 29 different NL, uh, you know, natural language processing tasks they compare with GPT-3 and they find that the model performs better. So not just the model is better, but also it is much more efficient to train and much more efficient to do inference also, right? Here is a short summary table. So uh, on average, you know, um, um, so, you know, if you basically look at GPT-3 model, there's a comparison to GPT-3 and GLAM model. And if you compare, well, you see the flops per token are much lower. Also, the training energy is much lower, about one third lower compared to the GPT-3 model. However, if you basically look at accuracy on average, zero shot, few shot one shot and few shot across 29 different tasks, right, you observe that the accuracy is, is much higher. Right? So that's that. Uh, here are also some examples. So examples of tasks. Some tasks, yes, the mixture of experts model, uh, you know, uh, gives you gives you. Um, uh, um, I mean, the GLAM models basically give you better results, way better results. But in some cases, well, the GPT-3 model does perform better. On net net, on average, well, uh, the GLAM model performs way better uh, on these 29 different uh, on average across the 29 natural language processing tasks. So let's talk about uh, how does the GLAM's architecture look like. So as I mentioned, the GLAM model is a transformer-based decoder model. It is sparsely activated mixture of experts. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, basically, as per the standard mixture of experts architecture, it replaces the feedforward component of every other transformer layer with the mixture of experts layer. So as you see, on the right side, you see this uh, animation where the input and position embeddings are going at the bottom. And then you, know, you see that there is uh, uh, a multi-head attention and a feedforward sub-layer here. This is one transformer layer. This is another transformer encoder uh, decoder layer. And as you observe, you know every alternative, uh, every alternate, uh, you know, uh, feedforward layer is actually replaced by a mixture of experts layer. So what is a mixture of experts layer? Where mixture of experts layer is a layer where there are multiple feedforward, uh, you know, uh, experts as such, many independent feedforward networks which are in parallel, and uh, that is what they are called as experts, and that is what forms a mixture of experts sublayer. Right. The gating function uh, use uh, so so uh, there's a gating function which sort of decides which of those experts to call, and this gating function basically uses softmax to model a probability distribution over all experts. It sort of indicates that given a particular input token, which of the experts is going to be really good for that token. So the expert which is chosen depends on the token, and therefore can can be different for different tokens. Um, in their particular case, for a given input token, they choose to have two experts uh, which are activated for every token. Okay. Uh, although the total number of experts could be like say 64, but they will choose at any point of time for one token, only two experts, only two particular feedforward networks to be used so as to come up with the prediction. Okay. Um, for a MOE layer with the E experts, you know, if they were E experts, then uh, this provides a collection of O, E square, different combinations of feedforward networks, you know, uh, instead of uh, uh, one in the classical, in the classic transformer architecture, since you're cho choosing two, you have like basically uh, e, e square different experts, uh, different combinations that can be tried out uh, for different, for each of the different input tokens. Okay. Well, that's the major uh, uh, architecture of a mixture of experts model. However, there are also modifications to the basic transform model that they do. For example, they replace the standard positional embeddings with earlier relative embeddings, relative positional bias, right? That's one. 
Uh, second, you know, in the non MOE feed forward sub layers, basically this kind of a sub layer, which is non MOE feed forward sub layer, they replace the first uh, linear projection and the activation function uh, with the gated linear unit. Okay. Uh, so this gated linear, linear unit basically takes a, a component wise product of the of two linear transformations of the input. And then on top of that, they apply this activation called as the GLU activation or the Gaussian error uh, linear unit activation. Okay. The third modification is that they partition the weights and the computation into to using 2D sharding. The model is so large, a trillion plus size model, so therefore they can't train on a single machine. They do sharding, uh, 2D sharding, um, uh, and uh, that's how they partition the weights. Now, compared to, you know, here's a good comparison with respect to other large language models, you know, BERT, T5, and so on. So if you see, there are models which are densely activated, meaning there's no mixture of experts kind of a thing here. Um, and then there are also these mixture of expert kind of models. So, you know, there are these, uh, a uh, mixture of expert based models, previous models which are which are already available, G-shard models, switch C model, and so on. Uh, you know, switch C model is in fact in a, is in a trillion zone already, right? It has 1.5 trillion different parameters. But compared to switch C, you know, which is an encoder decoder model, GLAM is a decoder only model. And uh, well, it activates only 96.6 .6 billion parameters compared to uh, other models which basically have a way larger number of parameters in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, activated ones, activated ones. Okay. Um, now let's talk about how is GLAM model trained. So GLAM model has been trained using very high quality data, uh, pre-training data. So they took extra efforts to ensure that they uh, consume high quality and diverse data. It has been pre-trained using 1.6 trillion tokens. Um, you know, uh, so the diversity of the data is as follows. They take, uh, uh, you know, a large portion, 42% of the pre-trained data is filtered by pages. However, there is 6% which, uh, which comprise of Wikipedia. 20% comprise of conversational data, so Reddit and so on. Right? There's also forums data, books data, news data. Okay, so a different variety of data, and that two cleaned one filtered uh, using uh, uh, various cleaning scripts. Okay, uh, they trained several models. So as you see, there there are several different uh, sizes of these models that are available. The smallest one is 0.1 billion GLAM parameter model, and that's a, that's a dense model. So you don't do MOE there. So it has uh, you know uh, 130 million parameters to be more specific. Right. And it has uh, 12 layers, uh, a standard, you know, uh, decoder in that census. Uh, so uh, very comparable to GPT base in that census, right? Um, and it has, uh, you know, uh, 12 attention heads as well, uh, 64 uh, as a dimensionality of the head embeddings, and then, you know, 768 size dimensions and 3078 as a feed forward dimension size, okay? Now, um, the largest one is, of course, the 64 billion parameter, uh, uh, you know, uh, largest one is basically this 1.2 trillion parameter model, which is called a 64 billion 64 experts model. So the convention here is that you take the dense model with that many parameters and then you convert into a mixture of experts model, thereby increasing the capacity, the parameters a lot. However, you know, the activated number of parameters don't increase too much because at any point you use at the most two experts, right? So that's that. It has uh, 64 layers, so it is a pretty deep model uh, compared to the smallest guy. And um, it also has, uh, you know, 64 experts. That's that. Okay. So the largest GLAM model was, of course, trained on uh, with large infrastructure, uh, 1,000 plus uh, um, uh, cloud TPU uh, V4 chips. Right. So uh, if you basically train such large models, of course, you have to care about 2D sharding and so on uh, because you can't fit things in single machine RAM. But then you also have to do some other tricks. For example, you know, uh, the training can actually diverge very easily. Divergence basically means that you can easily get NAND losses and so on. Uh, so therefore, to avoid those um, two tricks uh, that they use are uh, very nice. So you skip weight updates for a batch if there are any NANs or infinities in the gradients, right? Of course, if you have NANs or infinities in the gradients and the overall loss when you update the parameters and so on, they go, they go NAN and that causes instability, right? Um, the other way to basically do this, you know, sometimes it can happen that the gradients are not NANs and not infinities. However, when you update the weights, they can go to infinities, right? And therefore, the other way is to actually start restart from an uh, from an earlier healthy checkpoint. So you know there's an earlier healthy checkpoint, you restart, hopefully, you know, the randomization plays a role. And at this time, you basically don't end up with NANs or infinities, okay? Now, having said all that, how does GLAM model perform compared to GPT-3? Right. So um, uh, they actually evaluate across 29 different NLP tasks, as we discussed earlier, you know, 21 NLU and uh, uh, the remaining NLG tasks. Uh, these tasks basically belong to different main parts. So close and completion tasks, open domain question answering, Venograd style tasks, common sense reasoning, in context reading comprehension, super glue tasks, natural language inference tasks, and so on. Okay. Now, here's a comparison with GPT-3 on NLU tasks and on NLG tasks both, right? And uh, we are comparing orange is GPT-3, green is GLAM, right? And what you observe is that uh, across zero shot and one shot in both cases across NLU and NLG tasks, essentially uh, GLAM model performs way better than GPT-3. Right? Uh, in fact, here is a summary. So across these tasks, uh, uh, in a zero shot setup, uh, GLAM model is uh, uh, at least 5% better on 13 of the tasks or 11% uh, you know, within 5% uh, uh, margin, 5% difference, right? 
uh, well, it does out, uh, you know, uh, GPT-3 does outperform a uh, GLAM model in five of those tasks, right? In zero shot case, as well as in the one shot case. In the one shot case, of course, you know, the GLAM model performs slightly better uh, in the sense that you know, on 14 different tasks, it has five percent, more than 5% improvement in terms of, uh, in terms of performance accuracy in that sense. Okay. Now, from a data and efficiency perspective, well, uh, you know, uh, if you compare, well, uh, um, uh, GPT-3 is a smaller model overall size, you know, 175 billion parameters only compared to the 1.1, uh, 1.1 uh, uh, or 1.2 trillion parameters in GLAM model. But compared to the activated parameters, you know, they're only about, uh, uh, you know, uh, 9, uh, 0 0.097 or 97 billion, 97 billion parameters which are activated for GLAM model versus GPT-3 is 175 billion. It's a dense model. So that's that. Okay. Now, inference times, as I mentioned earlier, well, you know, uh, inference uh, uh, compute uh, in terms of gigaflops, uh, GLAM model basically takes a VLSR com uh, inference compute compared to uh, the GPT-3 model, as well as, you know, if you compare that even the uh, training part, well, uh, in terms of training compute, GLAM model does take larger compute power because it's a larger model. So training compute is larger. However, if you compute, if you if you compare the inference costs or uh, the training costs, both of in both the cases, GLAM model has a lower inference costs and also uh, lower uh, lower training costs. Okay, uh, compute yes, training compute is higher for GLAM model because it's a larger model. Clearly, okay. Now, learning efficiency. So, by learning efficiency, I mean you know if you basically uh, vary. Um, if if you if you continue to train right so uh, so uh, on the x axis what is shown is uh, training tokens right everywhere training tokens meaning you know you continue to do more and more epochs uh, you know how does the accuracy improve uh, over time so of course if you basically continue to do more epochs typically you expect the accuracy to improve therefore all these curves go up okay but what is also shown is uh, essentially um, uh, you know uh, dense models versus uh, uh, versus sparse models and what you observe is that uh, uh, you know, if you increase uh, and, and rather you also see this uh, GPT-3 kind of, a uh, um, you know, dot there. So that's a GPT-3 dot that you observe. So this compares with GPT-3 as well. So if you observe uh, uh, the solid lines essentially indicate the sparse models. And what you observe is that, uh, you know, uh, GLAM can be, uh, so, you know, those are sparse models and then the dotted lines are the dense models. So what you observe from all of these charts, uh, these are the upper ones are the NLG charts, the lower ones are the NLU charts. Upper ones basically are about zero shot, one shot, and few shot, right? So therefore, you, know, you can actually focus on one shot, and others also show similar behavior. That's that. So what you observe is that GLAM can be trained with significantly less compute, uh, sorry, significantly less data, you know, meaning less, less number of epochs than dense models. Okay. So as I mentioned, you know, the solid lines are basically the sparse model, the GLAM model, and the dotted lines are the other dense models. So you know, GLAM can be trained with efficient, with significantly less data than dense models to reach similar zero shot or one shot performance, right? Uh, or in other words, you can also say the other thing that if the same amount of data is used in sparsely activated GLAM kind of models actually perform significantly better than the dense versions, dense models, right? Okay, so now what are the scaling aspects of GLAM? So you can actually scale GLAM in two different uh, perspectives. You can actually increase the number of experts in the GLAM model and look at the score. So in all of these cases, few shot, one shot, and zero shot cases, as you increase the number of experts, say up to 64, you sort of observe uh, that GLAM model basically uh, continues to improve performance as you increase the number of experts from uh, uh, one to 64, right? So of course, uh, you know, if you have just one expert, it's basically equivalent to, uh, you know, a dense model. However, as you increase the number of experts 64, up to 64, while maintaining only two experts to be used at inference time, you basically observe that for a fixed budget of computation per prediction, adding more experts generally helps. Right, generally leads to better predictive performance. Now, you can also scale the model, keeping the number of experts the same, but uh, increasing the number of parameters, number of parameters in the model, right? So uh, here, uh, what is compared is, uh, you know, dense models versus uh, MOE GLAM kind of models. And uh, of course, in zero shot, one shot, and few shot settings. Uh, this is for NLG, this is for NLU. And in both the cases, what you observe is that average zero shot, one shot, or few shot, whatever uh, thing you see, uh, a GLAM model versus the GLAM dense models, uh, so if you compare the MOE, the sparsely activated models versus the GLAM dense models, uh, you observe uh, uh, that the performance sort of improves with the sparsely activated ones, right? So the solid lines are always on top of the dotted lines. Yeah, uh, uh, dotted lines being the dense models, right? Um, for both, for both the uh, NLU as well as NLG tasks. Now let's quickly and finally talk about the ethics and unintended biases in the model. Well, uh, similar to other large language models, essentially GLAM models also show these biases. Uh, they measure biases in three different ways, co-occurrence prompts, Vino gender, and uh, toxicity generation, degen uh, toxicity based degeneration. Okay. So co-occurrence prompts, the idea is that uh, you analyze commonly co-occurring words in the continuations when given prompts, uh, prompts like, uh, you know, uh, something was very, right? 
So now this term can be actually substituted by different kinds of things like uh, uh, gender, religions, racial or ethnic identity. So, for example, if you say he was very now, you know, uh, typically if you say he was very, it generates things like uh, great, you know, or good and uh, black and, you know, whatever, you know, those kinds of things. However, if you basically put up she, then it generates she was very pretty, she was uh, very beautiful and uh, things of things of that kind. So uh, basically saying, yes, uh, there are associative biases with respect to gender for sure uh, in, in the GLAM model. And here is uh, associative biases with respect to another dimension, uh, the race. So, for example, if you would uh, actually try to prompt the GLAM model with things like people who describe the Asian person as, you know, uh, the completions you get are something like this, right? So, uh, uh, black, polite, and so on. But if you would basically, uh, you know, put in blacks, you do get uh, uh, words of of that kind, right? So, words of uh, words of that kind. So, some some of them which could be toxic, some of them, uh, many of them are not toxic in general, but yes, they have indications of uh, stereotypical behavior, uh, stereotypical observations, yeah. Uh, Vinod Jainter, so uh, you can actually assess uh, large language models with respect to gendered correlations by using this Vinod Jainter data set, and that's what they use uh, so as to uh, so as to so as to figure out the accuracy in terms of co-reference error. So the idea is that uh, if it is stereo, uh, so the examples are designed in a way such that if uh, the model predicts a stereotypical co-references, then uh, it, uh, it does not score a point. Okay. So GLAM models fortunately have higher accuracy than GPT-3 in this particular uh, data set, meaning that uh, uh, they have stereotypical behavior. However, uh, you know, they basically care about doing the right co-reference resolution rather than uh, rather than bothering too much about the stereotypical behavior. Lastly, about toxicity de degeneration. Well, uh, just like many other large language models do, they also experimented with real toxicity prompts and they basically tried to generate completions for those prompts uh, and try to evaluate the completions for toxicity using the popular perspective API. But the observed is that yes, as you as the prompt toxicity increases, so if the prompt itself is toxic, then yes, the uh, you know all of their models of different sizes continue to uh, you know uh, generate uh, uh, completions with higher toxicity. Now, in general, this is not uh, what is ideally expected. Ideally, you would want the toxicity to stay flat, irrespective of uh, what is the uh, you know completion toxicity st to stay flat, irrespective of whatever be the toxicity in the prompt. But well. Uh, most uh, popular large language models show this behavior, and that is what they also see in their uh, in their model. As the prompt uh, toxicity increases, they also observe um, that uh, the toxicity of the completions that they generate also increase. You know, this is more more or less you know the behavior of large language models. They sort of overly strongly get influenced by the prompt. So they try to be uh, consistent with the behavior in the prompt. Okay. So that's it, folks. Um, um, you know, uh, let me summarize quickly what we uh, what we uh, discussed in this video. We talked about generalist large language models called as the GLAM models. The GLAM models are sparsely activated mixture of expert models with high quality data pre-training. They have better accuracy than dense counterparts of similar effective uh, floating point operations, and also GPT-3 as tested on 29 NLP tasks in zero shot, one shot, and few shot settings. The 1.2 trillion GLAM model is a trillion parameter range model. It has 64 experts, and uh, even though it is such a large model, it uses one third energy compared to the GPT-3 model for training, and also inference-wise, it is way more efficient. Okay. That's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching. Uh, connect with me on my LinkedIn, and uh, you know, feel free to have a look at my research on my home.